We'll get started in just a second. But like I said, if you've got any questions as well for Martin as we go through, then please use the Q&A function, which is available on the screen in front of you. Uh, and we've allocated some time at the end of today's session to uh, ask Martin as many of those questions as uh, we possibly can in the time given. So uh, if you do think of any as we're going through, make sure you use the Q&A function and they'll come straight through to us and, uh, and I'll ask them uh, to Martin at the end of today's session. Right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Learn Lounge by SpringPod. Now, if this is the first time you've come across SpringPod, we're an early careers network for young people who are considering their next steps, be it employment, apprenticeships, college, or university. And as part of this new Learn Lounge series, we'll be bringing you lots of inspirational career stories and some insights from some well-known names. Uh, we've had some fantastic guest speakers, including international polar explorer Anne Daniels and best-selling uh, author and maths expert Rob Eastaway. And we hope you tune in for those talks. But like I said, if not, you can watch those replays on demand on the Learn Lounge website. My name's Joe, and I'll be hosting this session of Learn Lounge. Just a couple of pointers before we start. The talk should last around 40 minutes. Uh, don't forget to ask questions to Martine as we're going through. And uh, you can join in the conversation using social media, hashtag Learn Lounge. And we'll be raising money for the Children's Trust. And uh, we'll be talking more about that later on at the end of today's session. Right, today we're joined by the extremely talented Martine Croxall, a BBC News presenter starting her career with the BBC in 1991. She has extensive experience working as a news presenter. She has now become a regular presenter for BBC News and has covered some of the biggest events of the past two decades. We'll talk more about those very shortly. She's here to talk to us today about what life is really like as a professional news broadcaster. It's such a privilege to have someone with her specialist knowledge and experience here with us today. I'm very, very excited. Uh, Martin, welcome to Learn Lounge. Thank you so much for being here. Joe, thank you very much. It's uh, lovely to be invited to talk about yourself instead of other people. <laughs> <laughs> now, Martin, you've obviously led you know such a, fan, a fantastic and fascinating career. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about uh, where it all started? Because it started at BBC Radio Leicester, didn't it? Yes, it did. Um, and I didn't begin uh, reading aloud. And the reason I, I sort of called the talk reading aloud is that Often people say to me, and my, including my daughter, who's now 16, but when she was five, she said, but mummy, don't you just read out loud for a living? And I can do that. <laughs> and, and in a way she's right, but in a way she's, she's not. Um, yeah, I didn't ever intend to be uh, on air. I wanted to work in radio and I wanted to be a magazine programme producer. I had no intention at all of ever being on air, be it on the radio or on TV, because I was quite, I was relatively shy in a way. It was kind of weirdly, I was confident in one way, but kind of shy in another. And when I was at school, I was the girl who would always blush crimson when I had to answer a question in class. So the idea that I would ever put willingly put myself, you know, onto the airways was just, there was just no way. Um, so I started work at um, Radio Leicester. I'd been to university. I went to Leeds. I did a geography degree. I took a year out to travel, mostly across Africa. Um, I worked for my parents. They had a textile business. And then in the end, I just thought, I can't, do, can't be working in my mum and dad's warehouse forever. I really need to go and see if this radio thing is what I want to do. And in those days, it was much less formal in the way you could approach the BBC these days, quite rightly, it is about equality of opportunity and you have to apply to most of the time, unless you drop lucky with someone that you know, you have to apply for a proper work placement and it's all done formally. And then there's, there's more equality of opportunity there. But when I was um, starting out in 1991, um, I just rang the local radio station. I asked to speak to the station manager and I said, I think I've like to come and see what you do and he said fine come and that was it so I pitched up um the following week and I walked into the newsroom and people were running around answering the phones and uh flying up and down the the, the newsroom with tape recorders they were called ewers and they were used to because remember this is the analog era we were well pre-digital pre and you you record everything on a quarter inch tape it's like a really heavy handbag with these slowly moving um reels of tape 
and you would literally cut it with a razor, mark it with a China graph pencil, cut it with a razor blade and stick it together with some splice tape. It was that rudimentary. And I, I walked into this newsroom and everybody was busy and everybody seemed to know what they were doing. And I was thinking, how do they all know what they're doing? It was absolutely baffling, but it was really exciting. And then I was put with a um, morning phoning programme called Talk Back, and I was working with two really experienced um, older male broadcasters, the producer and the presenter. And I was like a sponge. I just soaked this stuff up. I was just so interested in everything about it. And um, I started off, I did a work placement for, it was open-ended. I was just turning up and working for nothing. And I literally started answering the phones, making the tea, showing guests in and out, doing a bit of clerical work and not earning anything. I was very fortunate that my parents could lend me a car and they could have me living back home. And they just said, look, you know, come back and you, you don't need to pay any board, any rent or anything. Just come back and get started. And then one day I was in the newsroom. This is where we probably need to go on to the next slide. Um, I was asked if I would. This is it. Yes. Um, so that's me at the age of 22 and um, the years have not been kind and <laughs> I was asked if I would go and do um, cover the live launch of a charity to raise money to um, plant trees in a national forest in the northwest of Leicestershire because our patch was, it was Radio Leicester 837 AM and 104.9 FM um, and we covered Leicestershire and Rutland and it's the county that I'd grown up in. I'd been to school in Coventry. So I knew the patch pretty well, but I got to know it really, really well after this. And I said, well, why, 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 why am I going to go? And they said, well, there's nobody else. It's lunchtime. People are either out on lunch breaks in days when you've got a lunch break, or they were out doing other stuff. And you've got to go. And you've got to talk on the radio. And I didn't want to do it. I really didn't want to do it. Anyway, so they sent me down to the clock tower. And if you know Leicester, it's the, the place where you meet. You always, I'll meet you by the clock tower right in the middle of the city and I was so worried about getting on air they'd sent me with this giant bag of kit called a wood and Douglas and it was literally you switch it on or off or to standby and it has a big aerial and it could read the signal transmit a signal to the buildings around it I was so nervous about switching this thing on and off but they sent an engineer with me. I mean, it was not the most suspicious of starts. And then the person um, that I had to interview was this character called Woody Tree, who you can see on the screen. And um, he was the mascot for this charity campaign. So my first interview was with a man dressed in a rubber tree suit, <laughs> which, you know, it's as, as broadcasting careers sort of go, it's not, it's not the most um, high-flying start, is it? But... <laughs> found that I could do it. I could describe what was going on. I could be fluent and I enjoyed it. And it came across that I enjoyed it. And I got back to the um, radio, to the newsroom and people were so pleased for me that it had gone well. And from there, I just started, um, I did my broadcasting back to front, really. Most people go and do a postgraduate diploma in journalism, say. And these days, like you're doing, Joe, a, a degree maybe in broadcast journalism, they, they weren't. Um, really around in my day and you do a lot of recorded work but I did mine back to front I did all mine live so they trained me to use the radio car and I spent six months going out, out around the county doing live broadcasting which was a fantastic grounding because it meant that I learned to think on my feet and I um, in local radio there's never enough money and so you learn to be really resourceful you know and you pull a program together with an old pencil and a bit of string somehow and it was it was just a fantastic way to start and then I um, I was sent on a lot of training courses the BBC had a training unit in London in those days and every few months you'd go down and you do a, a course in you know um, interviewing technique or creative packaging for, for reporting and I just had a, mo a fantastic grounding from the BBC in broadcast law and things like that. So you don't um, libel anybody. It's much more difficult to do it like that these days. You Most people have a degree, not all, but most have a degree. And you would probably do a, either a, a, a broadcasting degree or a, um, a diplo postgraduate diploma. But back then it was much easier to do it this informal route. 
And in the end, over the, the subsequent five years or so, I did pretty much every job on the station. I would stand in as news editor. I presented nearly all of the programmes on the station. I guess that's what I really wanted to do. And I did a news conversion course in 1993. So you went off to London for, for, for three weeks to be trained in the sort of skills that a journalist needs. And then you went off to a station somewhere else. So I went to Bristol for a month. I chose Bristol because I didn't know the city at all. And I thought if I can throw myself into a city where I don't know anyone or anything, I'll be able to swim anywhere. And then I went back to Radio Leicester as a journalist rather than a programme assistant, which is what I had been before. And then I did some training in TV. I went through... Um, News um, East Midlands Today in Nottingham. I'd had a, a, a four month training attachment there. I took loads of story ideas with me so that I got on air a lot. I put together a show reel and I never applied for anything I didn't want to land. You know, I only ever applied for jobs that I wanted. And then there wasn't a job for me there, so I went back to Radio Leicester. And then about a month later, I landed a job at Newsroom South East. And I was just I think I was lucky the first day I got there and I was sent out on a story even though I was a broadcast journalist and I had to be able to turn my hand to anything we used to write CFAX pages you probably even remember what CFAX was um it's like a text service on the BBC uh precursor to the website um we had to do subtitling we had to do desk production field production you know you you cut track and rushes for a correspondent who was filing stuff to you it was a really great job but I wanted to be a reporter and a presenter and I'd said that to them when I got the job so they knew what my ambition was and I'd been there about I think I'd done about five or six shifts this happened seems to have happened to me now I realize I just realized this seems to happen quite often that I just seem to be there and showing an interest of being enthusiastic and offering to help which are all things I would advise everybody to be and do and they just I got a phone call one night from a colleague and she said um you're on tomorrow morning I said what do you mean she went you're reading the bulletins in the morning I said no 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 I'm producing the bulletins tomorrow morning she went no Charlie's gone sick you're pretty presenting them I'm going to produce you wow so I know I'd been there I think it was my fifth or sixth shift at Newsroom Southeast and their view was, well, you've done loads of radio. You've said this is what you want, so get on with it. Yeah. Um, um, I now work with a, the creative director at the at BBC News. is a wonderful chap called Chris Cook, who you, you, you'll see on Twitter. And he was working in presentations, so the continuity bits between the programmes, on the first morning that I ever read a bulletin at um, 6.26 in the morning. And he was there and saw me do it. And I now work with him all these years later. And he knew how nervous I was, you know. So um, I was, it was three and a half minutes of airtime or something like that. And most of it was weather and travel at the end. But I did it and I did it okay. And I was able to talk to time and I looked all right and I sounded all right. And, and it went on from there. And so although I was a broadcast journalist, and essentially, a, you know, a, a jack of all trades, I was very lucky that I got the opportunity to present and um, then I went, I'd been there, for, I was there for three years. And then I heard on literally on the grapevine from my, um, a, somebody I'd worked with in Nottingham that they were looking for a presenter at Television Centre. I applied and I got the job and I've been there ever since, since 2000. So I did 10 years on BBC World. And then I did, and then I moved back to the news channel full time in 2011. And I tend these days, since 2013, I tend to do the, the uh, evening shift and I get to present the papers, which is a kind of unscripted look at the front pages of the, the next day's newspapers with two guests. And what's really nice about that is that, yes, it's serious. Most of the stories are serious. You're still talking about some pretty grim things a lot of the time, but there's room for a bit of levity and you get the chance to be a bit, have a bit of fun. And that's what's really nice about it. And I, although the hours are shocking, um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's good fun. <laughs> and you mentioned as well that um, earlier, most, most people have a degree when they're going into a job like this, you know, nowadays. What sort of things could people be doing 
to help themselves stand out because if having a degree you know is, is the base mark standard on 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 the whole what sort of things can people be doing that will help them stand out on their application well i would say before university you don't need to go and do a broadcast journalism degree you can but you certainly don't need to and i think we're talking about broadcasting i think what you need in a newsroom are people who have broad interests we're broadcasters not narrow casters so our newsroom is full of people with degrees from entirely different disciplines so we've got people into politics who've done engineering, who've done history, geography, you name it, they've done it, languages. And I think that's a strength in a newsroom is to have people with lots and lots of different interests and expertise. I do careers talks with people and they say, I wanna do what you do. And what they really mean is, I wanna be on the telly. <laughs> and they don't necessarily want to be a newsreader, a news presenter or a journalist, they just wanna be on the telly. Yeah. Um, you could end up never being on the telly because there are a lot of people in my newsroom who would like like to do what I do and they will they will never get the chance because there aren't that many jobs available. Now, somebody will, and that's not, you should never, ever, ever be put off because I was told several times over the years, oh, you'll never do this and you'll never do that. I, I would not dream of saying that to anyone because I just used to think, well, I'll prove you wrong. Yeah. If you don't want to give me this opportunity, I'll go and find one somewhere else. So I think what you need to do is be able to produce evidence that you really want to do the thing that you say you want to do. And these days, because of um, so many digital opportunities, you can produce that evidence for yourself. You can write, you can blog, you can vlog, you can do podcasts, you can set up your own YouTube channel. I mean, be careful what you put on these platforms because you get it wrong, you could be in trouble. Mm. And if you want to work for a, 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 you know, a, a broadcaster, you will need to demonstrate some sense of impartiality. So if, it's, if something is overtly political, you might need to be careful because um, you won't then necessarily be able to say that you are impartial politically. So you just need to be careful. But when I um, was starting out, I wrote for my local, the, the, local, the newspaper at university, we didn't have radio and TV stations then, so but I kept my clippings, my you know my cuttings from the paper. I did a stint at my local radio, local uh, newspaper, the Hinkley Times. I wrote the weddings page two weeks on the <laughs> yeah, and um, so things like that just to show that you really mean it. You're not just saying it; you can actually produce the evidence and show that you're engaged. You know, if you want to be a journalist, you need to take an interest in politics. Uh, again, be careful on Twitter, be careful on Facebook and, your, and, and, and any of your other platforms because these things are there forever. So just be careful what you post. But you, you, know, you can create a portfolio to demonstrate that you really, really mean uh, what you say. The other thing is that the BBC, which is brilliant now, is that they do do um, post, they do uh, production and journalism trainee schemes for people who haven't gone to university. And that, so that's attracting um, different people to the BBC who would never have considered the BBC as a, for a career before. And um, the digital journalists were all non-graduates. They were people who were never going to go to university. And the intake I talked to about three years ago, there was a, um, somebody who'd been working in a fish and chip shop and somebody who'd been working in a garden centre, somebody who'd been unemployed because they, they lived in part of the country where they couldn't get a job. But what they could demonstrate was a real interest in digital filmmaking and things like that. And um, so that's great because it's attracting a more diverse group of people to come and work for us. And that's got to be good. Just talk us through a, a typical day for you when you walk well, into the newsroom. How does that look? Well, a typical day, let's pretend that COVID isn't happening. Wouldn't that be nice? Is um, there such thing as a typical day? No. Well, I'll tell you what, a, I'll tell you what a typical day is normally like and then I'll... Mm tell you what a typical day is like now um i get into work a couple of hours before i'm due to go on air my first port of call is the assistant editor who's deciding on the content of the output while i'm on it um then i go to makeup and i take a load of information read i read in so i go and um i find out from the assistant editor who are the interviews i'm going to be doing uh what are the live events that i might need to be covering so it might be something like 
President Trump's going to do a press conference in the, what, the Rose Garden about some spending package. And I need to be able to talk into that, talk around it, know the context and um, take us to the, the, the Rose Garden when, the, the, when it happens and then sum up off the back and talk about context again. So they're the, the live things that I'm expecting. And I read in while I'm in makeup. So normally we get our hair and makeup done. That's the question I get asked more than anything. Do they do your hair and makeup? <laughs> yes, they do. They, they do. Um, and do they give you a wardrobe allowance? No, they don't. And um, by the time I'm ready to go on air, a couple of hours later, I've read in all the stories for the day. I know what I'm going to be faced with in theory. And I get I have to put my kit on underneath my clothes. I wear this belt and it's got a power pack in it for my microphone, for my talk back. And then 10 minutes before I go on air, I go into the studio, put that on, and we're ready to go. Uh, at the moment, I'm going into work much, much later. I arrive about 45 minutes before we go on air. We've got far fewer people in the newsroom because we're all socially distancing. Lots of people are working from home. And I do my own hair and makeup at home, and I drive in, and then I leave as soon as I come off air because we want as few people as possible in the newsroom. So that's what a typical day looks like. Um, but it doesn't always, of course, work like that. <laughs> so what are the uh, not so typical ones then, as the as the slide says, when, yeah. uh, when it doesn't always work? The beauty of um, my job is that it changes. Um, some shifts are really quiet and you find yourself re pretty much reading the same bulletin five times in a row. Uh, they're not the most interesting days. The most interesting days are when you walk in and you think you know what you're going to do and then it all changes. And in November 2015, that's exactly what happened. This is where the video can play. Where a football match was taking place between France and Germany. Well, the shootings at the restaurant happened in Paris's 10th arrondissement. These are some of the images that have been coming into us as we try to make sense of this very confused picture of a number of uh, violent attacks that have happened uh, in the last uh, couple of hours. So that was um, a Friday night and I'd gone into work and it looked like it was a fairly humdrum evening and I went to makeup, came back from makeup. I'd been on air since 6.30, and then about half past eight, we got um, a newswire drop to say there'd been shots fired in Paris. And we thought it was Friday night. Is it fireworks? Is it some car back firing? Sometimes people mistake gunfire, particularly in Britain. In, in America, they recognise it straight away. But in, in Europe, where we're not used to hearing it so often, um, you can mistake it. And then we got more reports about another 20 minutes later that something else had happened. And then a colleague of mine, Tim Wilcox, who um, I don't know whether you remember the Chilean miners who were stuck down the mine shaft for all those. Um, <clears throat> he broadcast, uh, he was on air for 14 hours in English and Spanish on the day that they were all brought back to safety. So he's, he's, he really knows what he's doing. So he went on air at nine o'clock in the evening, not really knowing what was going on and trying to sort of keep keep things on the boil. Then the 10 o'clock news was on and I didn't really touch it. And by half past 10 in the evening, when I went back on air, we knew that something quite serious was happening in Paris. There'd been these multiple um, attacks. And so I was on air then for the next three hours and none of it was really scripted. Certainly in the first hour, you're feeling your way. In some ways, it's the easiest journalism in the world because it's the who, what, when, where, why, how questions that we get taught to ask from when we're really little. Um, and you're trying to piece together the story. You're trying to work out what do we know? What don't we know? And I think it's really important to be honest with the audience and say, we're not sure about this yet. And we need to clarify that. And we take our time with that. We don't make statements that we can't substantiate. If we haven't had a BBC producer or correspondent verify a fact, we caveat it very heavily and we'll say, look, we can't confirm this yet, but we're hearing. Which is where that night Twitter was actually quite um, dangerous because people post stuff on Twitter um, without any real um, sense of responsibility to what they're posting. And 
I, as certainly as a broadcaster on air, doing a live and continuous breaking news story, can't rely on it. Unless you're reading something from the French government or from the French police, be very, very careful with what you with what you use on air. And it was a, a horrible, horrible story, of course, but it was also an extraordinary story to be part of, to be able to tell. And um, I kept, I was supposed to come off air at 12 o'clock and my boss said, would you go keep going for another half an hour and another one and another one? And so I did three hours in total. And I was really proud of the team that I was working with. They were an amazing team of very, very experienced producers. And what was really interesting is that the gallery, which is where the producer, the output producer and the, all the technical people sit, the big, the room with all the big screens in, was really quiet because we all knew each other. We're all very experienced and we all just trusted each other to, to get on with it and be really quiet. And it is one of the best pieces of broadcasting I think I've been involved in. I was going to say as well, you were you were the BBC's main presenter on that back in uh, November 2015. Um, the CBS Network News correspondent, uh, David Henderson, um, said some really nice uh, things about you just uh, after um, the, uh, the coverage. He said, uh, despite the unspeakable carnage and utter chaos across central Paris, a no-nonsense BBC World News presenter brought level-headed clarity to the attacks and horror in Paris with an understated professional style that was a reflection, I believe, of television's great news anchors like Walter Cronkite, Peter Jennings and Dan Rather. Now, how does that make you feel? He's compared you to some of the world's greatest on-screen journalists. Um, well, it's faintly ridiculous. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm not those people. I, mean, I, I I used to watch Peter Jennings a lot. I loved Peter Jennings. Um, it's extremely kind, generous, uh, probably not true, uh, incredibly humbling. You're only as presenters should always remember they're only as good as the teams behind them. We're kept, we're the, we're the gatekeepers. You know, we're the people who are on air. But there's a huge team behind you making this happen. And you you have to sort of do the final bit of polishing of the news before it, before it gets out. But um, if pre presenters could come unstuck if they don't remember that they're part of a bigger team, it was very kind. David Henderson wrote to me and um, asked me a few questions before he wrote that. It was extremely generous of him. But um, as you can see um, from this next clip, uh, it doesn't always go that well. <laughs> it's like we have to be able to cope with all sorts of things that frequently go wrong. Good evening and welcome to BBC News. I'm Martine Croxall. It's nine o'clock. I'm just going to move back to the uh, main set. I know this has happened before, uh, but here we are. If I sidle in, you can pretend that you haven't noticed. Here we are. Lewis Hamilton has won the Formula One World Championship for the second time with victory in the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely that, that brilliant. Quite often, um, because our cameras are controlled by automation codes, and if an automation code is left in that is the incorrect one, the camera just does as the automation code says. And if the if the automation code says turn to the catwalk, it goes to the catwalk, and I might be at the desk or the other way around, as in that case. So um, you you have to get used to being able to cope with a lot, a lot of stuff going wrong and it not matter, not needing to matter. So, Because we, we've seen that happen quite a few times, um, you know, with with other people. That seems to be when you, I don't know if anyone else does this, but I'm a bit of a news geek on, on YouTube. There are compilations, you know, of news bloopers and that that comes up quite a lot. You're in there quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, me, yes, it seems to happen to me. I, I, I've got a bit of a reputation. It must be me who's jinxing it. But it, <laughs> um, it's human error. Somebody's not taken out an automation code that they didn't need, and the camera just does exactly as it's told. So, um, it, you know, it, it, in that case, it didn't matter so much because the story was about Lewis Hamilton winning the Formula One championship. Uh, if you're in the wrong place and you're trying to talk about a number of people having died, it's hard to make light of it without it sounding really clunky because it's that tone thing again that you, you know you've got to get your tone right. What are the bits that you most enjoy about your job? What are the perks that come um, with it? The variety, the um, not knowing quite what you're going to get when you go in. 
I work with really fantastic people who care enormously about what they do. Uh, I get to talk to some very, very interesting people to do lots and lots of live interviews, especially at the moment. Um, so many of the interviews are with scientists who we'd never, ever normally get to talk to. But you know, immunologists, epidemiologists, virologists, you know, very, very smart people who bring their life's work to you and you get the chance to talk to them about it. And also to hold people to account, to be the, um, the person who asks the, the questions on behalf of the viewer. And it's a massive privilege. It really is. I mean, I, I'm so lucky to do the job that I do. Um, but it, yeah, I think it's the variety. And then when it comes to, you know, there will be times when, for example, like the uh, Paris attacks, when you do have to report on some really, you know, unpleasant um, and sad stories, would you say that that is um, a not such a good part of the job? Or would you say that that is part and parcel with it? It's you just have to deal with it. I think that it's a, it's the privilege. It's the first draft of history idea, you know, the fact that you get to tell the story for those people who are affected and the older i get the sort of more emotional about it i become i mean hopefully you won't see that on air because i'm not there to tell you how to feel i'm there to tell you what's happened and you can decide for yourself how to feel but i do get affected by it i feel immensely sad and sometimes quite tearful on air you know when you're reading that 466 people have died on a particular day of this hideous virus. That's 466 individual tragedies and families just in this country, never mind the hundreds of thousands around the world who are affected. You know, that's that's just heartbreaking. And after the Paris attacks um, night, I went home, I got home about half past two, and I put the telly on. I knew what had happened, but I put the TV on and I watched till about four o'clock in the morning. And I couldn't switch off. And I was I was very, very down that next day. Are you taught to try and separate yourself from what you're reading, you know, separate your emotion from, from what you're reading and just try and stay, you know, quite robotic about it? No, you know, I, I would not want anyone to be robotic. I think you need to think really carefully about what you're saying. You're telling a story. Sound like you care. Yeah. That doesn't mean to say that you emote. It's like, oh, 466 people have died. You know, it's not that. But sound like you care about it. Sound like it matters. Um, and that will inform your tone of voice. We're not taught to separate ourselves from it. But I think once you've spent quite a bit of time in the BBC, and usually you'll have spent quite a bit of time in newsrooms or, or whatever before they let you go on air live, you'll have clocked up quite a lot of experience and you'll have sort of soaked up the atmosphere and the do's and the don'ts of it. And I think you um, you watch other people and you know you work out what, what works and what doesn't work. And you should always be yourself because you'll get caught out if you're trying to be somebody else. You know, you don't, you're not acting. But I'm not there to tell you how to feel. I think that's what's really important. I'm there to, to tell you the story. Have you got two do's and two don'ts for people like myself? Um, be prepared to start at the bottom. Do start at the bottom. There is nothing wrong with that. Don't think that nobody owes you anything. So start at the bottom and work really, really hard. Ask lots of questions. Listen. Be enthusiastic. If you don't know something, please ask. Get to huge amounts of trouble if you pretend you know something and you don't. Read widely, soak up lots, read lots of different sources of news, watch it, listen to it, read it. Um, and don't apply for jobs you don't want. I was, I once I tried, rang up about applying for an environment producer's job. And the head of the department went, you don't want that job. I said, yes, I do. And he went, no, you don't. You want to be an environment correspondent if you come and do this at all. He said, I see you on the television every morning reading the bulletins on Newsroom Southeast. You don't want to be a producer. And he did me the best favour. So I didn't apply for the job. The next job I did apply for, I got, and it was a presenter's job. So, uh, and also don't be put off by people who tell you you'll never do something. If you want it, you will. You'll find a way. That's, uh, that is, 
spoken to me personally actually <laughs> so um thank you for that no I, I i appreciate it as well um we've had uh, loads of questions um coming in whilst you've been uh chatting away um let's get started with guest 134 who uh has asked what's the best piece of advice that you'd like to give to someone who wants to start out as a journalist in any format um show an interest in the news um, you've got to know what's going on in the world, what's gone on in the world. History is really important. Geography is really important. Um, we, call, we talk about having really good hinterland. You know, do you do you know a, a lot about a lot of different things? Yes, you might have a specialism. You might be really interested in politics or really interested in the environment, but you need to be able to uh, write with authority. Um, so show, read, read widely. Um, Guest 77 has asked, uh, well, they've said that they enjoyed that little anecdote for, uh, from your news channel uh, compared to a BBC One bulletin. Uh, oh, sorry, they changed. Enjoyed that little anecdote from your daughter about reading aloud. Uh, <laughs> so now with all your experience, how would you define what a news presenter does? A news presenter tells you what's going on in the world. And hope and 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 to do it effectively, you need to trust them and have confidence in them that what they're telling you is accurate and impartial. Yeah, always impartiality as well. Speaking of impartiality, you know the BBC is under a lot of fire all the time um, mm. for you know its doubts about its impartiality. What what more can can you as a presenter do to ensure that? everything is always impartial but I suppose you it always is as impartial as it absolutely can be well we well you have to set aside your views and you have to interrogate the story or question the person who's in front of you without fear or favor you may agree with everything they say but you will be the devil's advocate you will put the opposing side to it you need to be forensic and you need to um, be robust in your questioning of everyone if that's the nature of the question of the interview some interviews are for information some interviews are for entertainment some of them are more of a um, to, to, to be critical or to be uh, forensic is the word so if you're like that all the time with everybody that's impartial um, Guest 713 has asked the question which I started reading. Um, how different is the editorial control on the news channel compared to a BBC One bulletin and how much say does the presenter have? Um, I think a journalist has written that question. Yes. <laughs> the, BB, the big BBC uh, bulletins are big, the one, the six and the ten. Um, they have a set, set of um, producers who work on, on just those half hours. And there will be a lot of discussion throughout the day as to what do you lead on, what's the order of the story. In the news channel, we're much more fluid. Things move around a bit. You won't lead on the same story each hour. You might move things up and move things down. I, I know that the, the, the newsreaders like Sophie Ray with Hugh Edwards, they have a lot of input and a lot of discussion. They do a lot of their own writing. We probably do less of our writing because we don't have time. Um, but we do, I do have discussions about I, if I'm on air and I think that doesn't look right, that running order doesn't look right. So I'll say, could we move this or why don't we move that? Or wouldn't that story look better off the back of that story? So um, we're a bit more crash bang wallop. Mm. We're, not, we're not as polished as the six, the one, the six and the ten. Um, and that's why we love it, because it's all a bit um, seat of your pants. Um, but yeah, newsreaders do have, I think we forget that we are quite senior editorial figures within the teams because partly because some of us are, you know, a, a bit older and working with people who are only in their early twenties, they've got great news sense, but they don't have that experience. So you try and, you know, pass some of that experience on to them. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it is a very different feel, but the, uh, there are lots of, <laughs> I won't surprise you to hear, there are lots and lots of meetings that go on in the BBC throughout the day. And their editorial meetings, prospects meetings, where we kind of make sure that we're all aligned on what we think the main story of the day is. Who's the best person that you've interviewed? The best person? Uh, oh. uh, Dr. David Knott. Who, Dr. David Knott. Who is David Knott, N-O-T-T. -T. 
He's just written a book, which is on the Times bestsellers list, about his life as a trauma surgeon in Syria. He's why, British... why, was he, why was he your best interviewee? Um, because he's an extraordinary human being. He's done the most selfless things. He's gone and put himself at incredible in harm's way to, to help people during the Syrian war. Um, I'm also unusually for a medic and someone who does humanitarian work. He's prepared to call out the politicians who he feels are letting people down and as a consequence, people are dying. He's a very, very smart man and he's utterly admirable. We've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, if unfortunately we don't get around to answering your question, uh, we'll try and get as many of them uh, to Martin as we possibly can. Um, but guest uh, one two five has asked: If you were in hiring, what sort of skills would you look for in uh, a broadcaster? Uh, someone who had an interest in a lot of different subject areas. Someone who is confident to pick up the phone and make things happen to ring people up and say, can we talk to you? Will you come and talk to us? You have to be quite bold. Um, you'd have to be quite sort of self-assured, really. And someone who's not afraid of presenters, because sometimes presenters can be a bit scary to a young producer, but um, we shouldn't be, but we can. We can. <laughs> I would also try and pick somebody who compliments the rest of the team. Because if you've got loads of people who are great at politics, but you don't have people who are so good at sort of social affairs and health and education, you know, you want to have um, a team of all the talents, really. Um, guest 77 has asked, uh, you've probably already covered them, uh, but of all of the various news stories from the year just gone, is there one that you'd have liked to have been able to cover and why? The year just gone? Um, well, I'll tell you what, what, instead of the year just gone, are there any news stories that you wish that you look back on and think, you know, what, I really wish I was on that? No, because I've done most of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I would like is more time with each, with some interviewees. That's what I would like is sometimes we, we sort of allocate three and a half minutes as a standard set of time mm. so that's the kind of the audience attention span supposedly um sometimes you need much longer than that and i would really like to have been um i've just seen a comment a, a, a question about brown hair and a ginger beard um i think you just need to be uh, as thorough as you can be and sometimes we box ourselves into a corner with giving too little time for interviews because I mean, we've been sat here for you know over forty minutes now, and mm. I could I could sit and chat to you for ages. I feel like it's it's flown by. But the thought of I you having to sit there, for... <laughs> I'm happy to carry on if you want. Oh, I I really wish we could, but we've got um other sessions that we've got to get done. But thank you though. Um, I was just thinking, you know, you could be sat there for three minutes, and you've got to try and get the best out of a person in three minutes yeah. time. Really how hard. how do you how do you you know, forensically analyze someone in the space of three minutes. What's the one question above all that you need answering? Because mm. in broadcasting, we try to um, remain in the present to be contemporaneous. We tend to try to write in the present tense, like the government says, rather than the government said, because that's what newspapers do. And we also try at the end of a, if you've got time at the end of an interview to throw things forward. What's likely to happen next? What should we look out for? Um, you often don't have time for that. But what is there's, if there's one question you want to ask, what is it? And that will, um, that will um, influence and inform how you set out your interview. Um, guest 842 has asked, uh, you're the master of staying calm when things go wrong during live broadcasts. For example, cameras going wrong. Uh, what is the worst thing that's happened live on air and when you've actually been, you know, at your most panicked stage? I think it's when you can't hear the gallery, actually. Because you're utterly... When it all goes, when it goes quiet and you're like... Because we're on something called open talkback, which means that you can hear everything that's being talked about in the gallery. So people might be laughing and joking and swearing and messing around. 
And the people say, oh, how do you how do you talk while all that's going on? What's worse is that deathly silence. Mm. and you are utterly on your own and then you're trying to sort of wave to the floor manager to say my earpiece is gone I've got no talk back and then they have to step in and then they have to stand by the camera and talk you down and you looking at the clock and uh, they're trying to give you hand signals to show you what um what you need to be doing next and that that's the worst thing is not being in contact with your with your team who are supporting you and getting this um, program out on air um, are you ever worried or concerned about news presenters because they get a lot of flack for just presenting the news and, and reporting, you know, they're just doing their job? Are you ever worried about, you know, people saying things about yourself, about other presenters just for doing, you, just for doing your job? I think a lot of it is um, resolved by explaining what we do and why we do it. Um, I've had people be you know um, critical maybe about how we've covered the Middle Eastern conflict and once you explain how you try to maintain editorial balance across the piece they understand and I I know they were said don't feed the trolls don't feed the trolls but if somebody's getting got the wrong end of the stick I think if you engage with them and say if I could just explain the reason we do this is for that, that reason or the reason I ask this question is because and often people will go oh okay well thanks for engaging with me they might not still agree with what you've done or like what you've done but then they have a better understanding of it so um, considering how much news people apparently consume and how media savvy we're all supposed to be in the year 2020 there are still some quite basic misunderstandings about what we do and why um, so I think it's really good to engage with people and try to explain. And when they come to, if they come to the newsroom, you know, people who kind of hate the BBC, if ever they come for a look round, you can often convert them because yeah. you show them the, what the operation is, and they walk in and they see that newsroom set out underneath them, and then you take them into the studio. And if I have guests in, um, I have them into the studios, and they have their headphones on so they can hear what I'm hearing. They see it all going out. Then I put them in the gallery and then they see the output from the other side and they come out and they kind of, we forget how impressive it is because we're part of it all the time. And then they come out and they go, this is amazing. So yeah. you can do, you can convert people sometimes. Oh, brilliant. Well, once again, um, Martin, thank you so much uh, you. for taking the time out of your uh, commitments to share your story with us today. Um, just a reminder that we're also raising uh, funds for the Children's Trust. And uh, that brings us to the end of another Learn Lounge session. If you do want to donate to the Children's Trust, the uh, where, the link was just on the screen there. Uh, we're going to be talking, there you go, the childrenstrust.org.uk forward slash donate for children with uh, acquired brain injury. Um, right, on to uh, our next session. We, uh, we're doing an employer masterclass next, the future of work with uh, Andrew Bargary from uh, Campus and Schools Engagement Leader and Student Recruitment at PWC. Um, thank you so much for your support. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.